So I want us to look at this passage of scripture uh, from Ephesians and uh, chapter 2, verses uh, 19 to 22. I've got up there on the uh, PowerPoint for us. And Paul writing says these wonderful words. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Does it feel like you're in it? Yeah. But fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place in the Spirit. Let's just pray and ask God to open this passage to us. Father, we just come in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus. We thank you for this wonderful church, for the blessing that rests upon it. And Father, I pray and just hide your servant, that your word would come through, that only Jesus would be seen, that the Spirit of God would speak into this place and touch each soul. We give you thanks for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Come up to the next PowerPoint, please. Thank you. You know, I understand that the theme of this month is family. And as I was praying, I felt compelled to speak to you on the family of God, the church. And the title of my message today is, Your Family Here. So I want you to turn to someone and say, Your Family Here. Your Family Here. You know, a, a gentleman called Dr. Wayne Barber said this, I am so glad to be part of the family of God. You know, we sing it, but after you've studied the book of Ephesians, you just don't want to sing it. You want to stand on the hilltop and you want to shout out as loud as possible, I am so glad I am part of the family of Jerry. You know, I love the story of a hunter. He was going through the jungles in Africa when he ran across a dead, ferocious-looking rhinoceros. And standing next to it was this little pygmy standing proudly next to it. The hunter was amazed. He asked the man, he said, did you kill that rhino? And the pygmy said, yes, he did. And the hunter looked and he said, how did such a little fellow like you kill such a huge beast? The pygmy said, I killed it with my club. The hunter was astonished. He said, wow, how big is your club? The pygmy replied, there's about 90 of us. That didn't work so well. <laughs> there's about 90 of us. You know, the church is more than just a club. It's a family. Together we can do some amazing things. The wonderful family of God uh, is found in places. It's found in heaven and it's found on earth. And as believers, God has given us a sense of belonging, which is extended to all humanity. And I want us this morning to look at this passage in Ephesians chapter 2 and see what it means to be part of the family of God. Go to the next PowerPoint, please. God's family gives us a new identity and a sense of belonging. Paul begins in verse 19 with these words, Now, therefore. The phrase introduces a summary in the verse. Paul summarizes the result of all that God has done for us and the brand new identity that he's given each of us. Paul in verse 19 reminds us how our identity has been changed and how we found ourselves as members of the family of God. Before we came to God through Jesus Christ, as far as God was concerned and eternity were concerned, we were in a state of homelessness. Paul uses two very powerful words to remind us of our previous state of homelessness. He says that we were strangers and foreigners. But the word stranger in the Greek here does not mean citizens of a nation, but rather it speaks of a family relationship. Paul says it was a time when we were not part of the family of God. There was a time that when we were strangers. And it doesn't mean that we didn't exist, but we were not part of the family of God. We had nothing in common with them. Now the word stranger means that someone that we keep at a distance. To explain it another way, have you ever gone walking through the park some days? There's a little park not far from where Rob and I live, and sometimes I walk through it, and I often see families together, laughing and playing and having a good time together with the children 
But I notice is that you walk past and they don't even notice you. It's like you don't exist. You're not even worthy of a glance. By their actions, they have distanced you from them. That's how we were to the family of God until Christ came. We were distant from the family of God. We were like someone looking outside, looking in, but never allowed to come in. Some Bible says that, this way, then Paul goes on and says that we were foreigners. Some Bibles have the word aliens, which means that we are not part of the citizens of a country. It describes a person living in Australia with a passport or a visa, but they have no rights, yet they're subject to all the laws of our nation. Now Paul tells us that these two things, being a stranger and a foreigner to the family of God, has created a wall of hostility between us and God. Paul tells in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, that Christ has broken down the wall of separation that has, and brought us into the kingdom of God. There's an interesting event that took place during the First World War on the battlefields of France, which I think illustrates what Paul is talking about. A French sergeant and some of his men uh, had made a pact between them that should any one of them be killed in battle, the others would give them a Christian funeral. And as the battle continued, one of their comrades was killed. The sergeant and the four men uh, decided that they would now honor their commitment to their comrade and bury him in a Christian cemetery. Gaining permission from their commanding officer, they took their comrade to a Catholic cemetery. When they arrived at the church, they were met by the priest, who told them that he was duty-bound under the tenets of the church to ask them questions before he could commit or give permit to bury their comrade in the graveyard. So the first question the priest asked was, was your friend a practicing Catholic? The soldier said, well, we don't know. They said, well, did your friend say the rosary? Again, they didn't know. The priest said, well, did he have a picture of Mary with him? Again, they said they didn't know. Then the priest reluctantly told them he could not permit them to bury their friend in the graveyard as was against the church's tenant. However, he would permit them to bury their friend outside of the graveyard next to the northern fence. To this, the soldiers disappointingly agreed. Now the next day, the soldiers were ordered up to the front to continue the battle, but before they went, they decided that they would go back to the grave and pay their final respects to their fallen comrade. When they got back to where the fence was, they walked up and down the full length of the northern fence. They could find no place where the freshly grave dog had been where they buried their friend. They were quite bewildered and and concerned about this and were just about to leave when the priest suddenly came running up to them covered in dirt. He pumped and panted and got up to them. He said this, he said, I couldn't sleep at night. My conscience worried me that I had not allowed him to be buried in the cemetery. So I got up this morning. I took a pick, a shovel, hammer and nails and I moved the fence to include the fallen soldier for friends into the graveyard. What a wonderful picture of what Christ has done for us. You know, we've not been brought into a cemetery, but we've been brought into the family of God. Come to the next PowerPoint, please. What is the result of what Christ has done for us? Paul says that we have been made fellow citizens in the kingdom of God. Just not citizens. He says fellow citizens. This is a striking contrast to the dismal state that we were in before Christ found us. You know, it's worth pausing for a moment to consider the 180 degree change that has taken place in our lives. See, the words fellow citizens speak of intimacy. It can be better translated as the word compatriot. It refers just not to a citizen, but to a friend, a one of special bond or attachment, someone that belongs to the same group or the same organization. The difference that had been previously divided us, Paul tells us, no longer exists. Paul is not saying that these distinctions don't exist in the church, but rather, through Jesus Christ, they don't matter. 
They are still there. But there's no longer a barrier between our fellowship. Paul says that we are one. What a tremendous truth this is. Every believer stands on an equal footing before Jesus Christ. A footing of faith. Christ reaches out and embraces all believers regardless of our circumstances. Next, Paul lifts our status to an even higher level. He tells us that we are members of God's household. And the word household in the Greek is the same word for family. See, you can be a citizen of a country, you can be a compatriot or a friend, but you can still be homeless. Paul tells us that this is not the case for us. We are not homeless. We are part of God's family. We are children of a heavenly household. We are brothers and sisters together. Though we live in different houses in different parts of the city, we, when we come together on a Sunday afternoon or any other event, it's like a family reunion. Amen. We have been put in into a divine family. We have a home, an eternal home with God himself. God has given us a sense of belonging. Now, under Roman law, citizenship was awarded to an adult son of a Roman citizen or to an adopted adult son of a Roman citizen. And Paul probably had this in mind when he wrote in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, that we've been adopted as sons of God into the kingdom of God. Now, the Roman custom when by attaining manhood, a young man would cast off or throw off the garments of a child and then would put on a toga of vessels, a garment of manhood. When he put this on, it represented him that he became a citizen, enjoying all the freedom and privileges of citizenship and discharging its responsibilities. But most importantly, it allowed him to sit in the council of the family. Now the son putting on the toga was not a temporary condition for a special occasion. It was a transfer of ownership and new identity. And as that son entered manhood and became a citizen of Rome and took his place in the family of council, this is Paul's point. That we've been adopted into the family of God. That we are sons of God. We've become citizens of heaven and members of the family of God. What? Wonderful news this is. Paul says this, it's officially declared that the dividing wall has broken down and we are now full members of the family of God. We are 100% in. Of the next PowerPoint, please. Paul continues, not only have we been brought into the family of God, the church, but we've also been brought into a secure place. Paul says in verse 20, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now with these words, Paul now changes the metaphor to that of a temp temple. As a building, the foundation is everything. And it's no different in our natural and spiritual life. Now the necessity of a good foundation is seen up there on the PowerPoint. It's a house that rises out of the landscape in perfect communion with nature. In 1937, a gentleman called Frank Lloyd uh, Wright developed and built this home. This amazing house is under a waterfall. The waterfall actually flows through the house and comes out. Thousands of people visit this house every year and are just taken back, if you get on the internet, not, not, not now but later on, you'll see the, the marvelous design of this house. And people ask, how does it stand in this, in this situation? The guide explains that its vertical cores go down solid onto the rock. It's only because Frank Lloyd Wright built his house on solid rock in communion with nature that waterfall can flow through the house. The house in the waterfall stands to a testimony to Frank Lloyd Wright's architectural genius. You know, it's one thing to build a house under a waterfall. That's a communion with nature when everything is pleasant and beautiful. 
but is another to build in times when nature unleashes its fury. When the waterfall becomes a, a raging torrent and trees are upheavaled all around you, you need a good foundation. Yeah. And it's the same in life. We need not only a secure place when all things are well, but we need it when the storms of life hit our lives. When our lives seem to be turned upside down. And Paul tells us that God, the skilled architect, the great builder, has laid a foundation for that church family to withstand the storms of life. And he goes on and explains this foundation. First he says that we, the family of God, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What he is saying here, that our lives are not built on deception. They're not built on lies. They're not built on myths or fables. Rather, the foundation of the family of God is built upon the divine revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which was given by God's messengers, the apostles and prophets. We are built upon a divine revelation. Next, Paul says that Jesus is the cornerstone of the family of God, the church. Now, cornerstones in the ancient world had two major functions. The first was to support the whole of the building, but the second was the most important part. The whole building depended upon this one for unity and measurement. It was the first stone that was laid. All dimensions were taken from the cornerstone. Everything rested totally upon it. So it is with the church, the family of God. Everything rests upon Jesus. We are totally dependent upon Him. Therefore, our position as full members of the family of God is based upon a secure footing through Jesus Christ. Through Him, we now have, by faith, access to God and enjoy all the privileges as children of God who are sons of God. Of the next PowerPoint, please. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 21, that the church family is a place where we are needed. Paul tells us in verse 22, he says, in whom the whole building is being fitted together. Now there's some important words that we need to look at in this passage and related to the fact that we are part of the church family. Paul says, in whom, which refers to Jesus Christ, who is the sole source of the church's life and growth. And the word whole that's used here means all without exception. Not only are we welcomed into the family of God, but we are all so needed. See, we are just not put up with. We're valued. We are needed as members of the family of God. Paul continues here, in whom the whole building being fit together. And the word fitted refers to stones that have been, that have been prepared and tested. And he's talking about a temple here. And the word that's used here is of stones that the surface has been perfectly flattened, that has been made square through rubbing and custing, cutting and testing, and then they have been brought together to fit tight and snugly together. And we each bring into his part. Not only, that, not only are they cut, but it means that there is no mishap or inappropriation here. So Paul goes on and speaks about the whole family of God, each one of us, in our own way, using our talents and uh, to bring union in Christ. Now up on the PowerPoint, you'll see something there. In Ireland, it's a portrait of a girl's face. It started out as 11 acres of field in Northern Ireland. It ended up with the largest, what we call land, uh, portrait in the British Isles. Just so you know, on the right-hand side, You'll see a grey part going down. You see that? That's actually a road. Down at the bottom of the picture, you'll see factories. And on the right-hand side, on my right-hand side, it's really the same on yours, there are more buildings. This is a portrait of a little girl. The artist titled this one called The Wish. And it's by a fellow called Jurgen Rodriguez Durain. It's made up of 30,000 wooden pegs. 2,000 tons of soil, 2,000 tons of sand, miscellaneous items such as grass and stone, all bring it together. Now, in the beginning, only the artist 
knew what the final work was going to look like. He hired workers and recruited volunteers to haul material and to move them into place. As they worked, they saw little indication that something was about to emerge, but it did. Now from the ground, it doesn't look very much at all, but from above, the viewers see a huge portrait of a smiling face of a little girl. See, God is doing something on a grand scale in the church. He's the architect that sees the final picture. Every worker and volunteer needed to use their talents and skills to place the 30,000 pegs in the right place for the portrait to be completed and finished according to the artist's design. So it is in the family. We are just not in the family by God's grace. We are truly valued as a necessity. Each one of the workers and volunteers had an important part to play in producing this wonderful portrait of the little girl. So each of us has an important part to play in the church family. Come to the next PowerPoint, please. Paul continues in verse 21. He says, being fitted together, it grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now, Greek scholars tell us that the word grows uh, not only refers to an ongoing process, but a power that producing the growth comes from an outside source. In this case, we speak as God. But what does it mean? It means that the church family is not yet finished. There is still room in the kingdom, in the family, and in the temple of God. You see, the word growing here speaks about increasing. It means to be added consistently. You know, this should really excite us to share the gospel with our friends, our neighbors, and community beyond. The family of God is not restricted to one exclusive group. Christ died for all humanity. Everyone is welcome into the family of God. No one should be regarded by God or eternity as homeless. Everyone has an eternal home with God. Everyone should have a sense of belonging to the family of God. The image that's used in this verse is that of an organic union, such as branches spreading out in all different directions. Now, in Hampton Park in London, sorry, Hampton Court in London, there's a picture up there in the PowerPoint. It's of a grapevine in a huge glass house. And this vine is actually called the Great Vine. The vine is reported to be the oldest, longest living grapevine in the world. It's nearly 300 years old. It has one root that is um, nearly four meters thick. The branches run for 36 meters and covers the sides and roof of a huge glass house. Over the past 300 years, this vine has outgrown six glass houses. The old glass house has been replaced, the timber and glass can no longer plank anymore, and it's built by steel and polyurethane sheeting together. By careful cutting this, and pruning, this vine produces over 300 kilos of grapes each year. Even though the smallest branches, nearly 36 meters from the main stem, it still produces fruit. It still produces fruit. It's the same in the community of believers. No matter where the church is, no matter what corner of the world the believer find themselves in, because of our personal relationship with Christ, His life-giving power flows through us, Amen. and we produce fruit for the kingdom of God in every corner of the world. See, Paul is telling us that we are being built into a holy temple. So what is this holy temple all about? What is our purpose in being put into a temple? Paul calls this a holy temple. It means that, that we are set apart. We are dedicated. We are consecrated for the service of God. It's the purpose of God that might dwell in us, commune with us, and have fellowship with Him. God, the great master builder, architect, wants us to be part of His design. He wants to empower us with His ministry, His work. It's also a temple of the Lord or of Christ. The contact refers to a temple that's in union with Christ. You see, we are all have a part to play. We all have a part to play in together. And as we grow together with each other and with Christ, 
to glorify God. The family of God is a place where we fit perfectly. A place where we are special. Come to the next PowerPoint. Now Paul goes on to tell us that because we are members of the family of God, the church, we have now become the residents of the Holy Spirit both individually and corporately. Paul says in verse 22, in whom you also be built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. John Stott, the great theologian, says this, it would be hard to exaggerate the grandeur of this vision. The words being built together speak of an intimacy and indissolvable unity. The verse describes a community of saints in Christ who are continually being formed into a dwelling place for God and for the Holy Spirit. See, the church is not static. It's not complete, but it's constantly growing and being shaped to the dwelling place of God. Every believer plays a role in this. Notice here that the, the theme is on unity of the believers. Now, some people act like low and range of Christians. You know, how sad and how hurtful it is when family, when family members are estranged from other members. It's no different in the family of God. So Paul's point here is that we share in a deep connection with one another. We share a common foundation. We share a common cornerstone, Jesus Christ. The result of this family connection is that we have become a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And the word dwelling place in the Greek conveys the idea of a place to settle down. It means a permanent place like a home. Paul says that we become the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And many commentators feel the word dwelling place is better translated as home. Therefore the word indicates a permanency, a beauty, close fellowship, protection, and love. See, the term goes on and says, God in the Spirit. It refers to the Holy Spirit operating in our lives. And the word here, Spirit, that's used, it refers to something that's blowing, or something that's breathing, or something that's moving. Which is hereby, in the context, it means to give a life to a body. All those that belong to the family of God, the church possess and receive His Spirit. The Holy Spirit filling our beings with the life of God. Amen. In John's Gospel, chapter 14, Jesus promised the church if we keep His commandments, He would equip the church in His absence with the Holy Spirit. Jesus described the Holy Spirit as the Comforter, the one who's called alongside, one who's called along tonight to strengthen us. What an amazing truth Paul is explaining to us. God is building us together into a dwelling place, a family in which the Holy Spirit leads and guides us corporately and individually. You know, the great preacher of, great Chinese preacher of the mid 19th, uh, of, the, of the 20th century, by a gentleman by the name of Watchman Nee. Some of you may have read some of his books, but he makes this statement. He said, if you have a small amount of change in your pocket, you tend to walk along quite freely, carefree. He says, but if you've got a lot of money in your pocket, you put your hand on your pocket and you walk along guarding it. He went on and said these words. When we realize the Holy Spirit dwells in our midst, both individually and corporately, we walk, we are careful to walk in holiness and present our bodies as a holy temple. See, God's house, the church, wherever God's people are found, has become a spiritual building, an international community embracing all nationalities. Jesus has promised us as members of the church family that we are a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Truly, it's hard to exaggerate the grandeur of this vision presented to us by Paul. I have the final PowerPoint, please. I read a story, it's rather a sad story, a little while ago, and it's about a young African refugee by the name of Stephen. He's a man without a country, and he thinks he was born in Mozambique or Zambia, he doesn't know. He never knew his 
father, he lost his mother. He fled civil war and traveled from country to country as a street vendor. Without idea and unable to prove his place of birth, Stephen walked into a British police station and asked to be arrested. Jail seemed better to Stephen than trying to exist on the streets without rights or benefits of citizenship. The young man's experience of being homeless left him without intimacy, without comfort, without friends, and without family. He fitted nowhere. He wasn't special to anyone. You know, it's sad to know that in this world they are filled with so many people like Stephen, both physically and spiritually. For those who come to Christ, all that changes. The family of God is not restricted to an exclusive group. Christ died for all humanity. Everyone is welcome into the family of God. No one should be regarded by God or eternity as homeless. The church family is a secure place. In good times as well as in the storms of life. It's a place of safety. A place of belonging. Where we're connected with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. The family of God is a place where we all fit perfectly. A place where we're special. A place where each one of us have a very important part to play. In this place, in this place. We have a deep connection with one another. We have a common foundation. We have a deep connection with Jesus Christ. It's so wonderful to know that we are part of the family of God. We're just not put up with. We're valued as members of that family. So valued that God has chosen each of us to be the residents of the Holy Spirit. You know, we too can stand on the rooftops and shout these words. I am so glad I'm part of the family of God. You see, your family here. And we need to give thanks to God for the fact that He's brought us into the wonderful family of God. He's brought us into a place where we feel safe, where we can share the blessings of God, where we can step into that place where we can pray for one another, we can stand by one another, that we can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit moving through each one of us, touching us individually, guiding us individually, and guiding us corporately. But I should please stand as our musician plays. Please stand. You know, we're in this wonderful place of a family where each one of us are wonderfully accepted. Where each one of us finds security and a sense of belonging that can only be found in God. And that sense of belonging needs to reach out. There are many other thousands outside this community that need to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And if you're in this place here and you don't know Jesus as Savior, you want that connection with the family, something special. God never intended you to be homeless spiritually. He intended you to be part of the family, to be part of that. For those that you hear, I'm going to open the altar up. For those that need prayer, that as a family, we come and pray for one another. That we are part of a family, a family of God, that for all eternity.